Okay. Hello. Um, yeah, this is a video that pertains to section test number two. I'm going to go through each of the questions for you, give some sort of indication of what I'm looking for in terms of a response. Um, I should remind you that these questions relate to the video material, relate to the text, relate to the um, secondary video material that I posted to Moodle. You're responsible for all of this. So um, it's in your best interest to do all of the required readings and screenings for this course. Um, the test itself, as you can see, it's posted to Moodle now. Um, has blocks of text from the uh, the course syllabus, um, just the description of the section tests, and I followed those very very closely. Um, it, these tests are designed to test all of this material, and um, it's it basically it's five short answer and one longer answer question, just like your last test. Um, the missed assignment policy, um, please let me know if you're going to miss an assignment before the assignment, if at all possible. If you miss the assignment due to a uh, serious illness or some other sort of sky falling kind of situation, um, it, please let me know within 12 hours and we can work something out. I'm more than willing to work with you. Um, I noticed um, a number of students missed the previous assignment, um, uh, which will likely uh, pretty seriously hurt your grade, but um, it's there is still a good hunk of the grades for this class left, so um, all is not lost. Uh, so that's the missed assignment uh, policy. Um, it's your responsibility to ensure that you have properly uploaded your assignment to Moodle as well, so please double check. Um, and then uh, it, just because we did have some issues, there's a zero tolerance policy on plagiarism in this course. So if you're using external sources like Wikipedia, Cheat Notes, or something along those lines, uh, you have to reference that material. Right? It's okay to use sources other than uh, the course material or even sources within the course material. Just let me know that these are not your words. They come from somewhere else. And the principle is if I'm looking for it, I should be able to go find it. Right, so um, I've issued some warnings on that, and um, it, well, anyhow, we're moving on. So, readings Aristotle, Nicomachean Ethics, books one, two, and just section one of book three of the Nicomachean Ethics, um, and Hobbes' Leviathan, uh, chapters six through 19. Um, uh, let me see video material Aristotle's ethics my video um, Aristotle ethics part one from the podcast lectures um, school of life philosophy Aristotle uh, the Hobbes video um, my Hobbes video school of life political theory Hobbes and that's it for video content all right um, these are uh, the first part is the short answer questions um, and it's minimally three to five sentences um, in response for each by sentences I mean full sentences I had a few that um, it came in short of these minimum requirements and it's it's if if I tell you it's a minimum it, it, that's that's what you need to do in order to pass if you fail to meet the minimum requirements for a question you can't receive a passing grade that's what a minimum means right so um, so uh, by sentences I mean full sentences point form responses are really vague um, these are all two-point questions and um, they total in the first part to ten possible points um, so the first question and this argument is really the linchpin of Aristotle's um, philosophy here, right? Um, his ethics, at least, anyway. Um, briefly discuss the function argument discussed by Aristotle in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics. Right? Um, this is the argument I gave the example of the beer store guy just to illustrate it. What Aristotle is looking for is something more general than the function of a particular vocation or something along those lines. So uh, make sure not to just present an example of this argument, but to follow Aristotle in sort of expanding it to a general human function. 
how, by this argument, does Aristotle arrive at his definition of happiness, which I know is an activity of this whole uncord for, uh, with virtue, which I give you in the final longer answer question. But how does Aristotle get from the function argument to a definition of, of happiness? That's what I'm looking at, right? So um, that's your first question there. Um, second Aristotle question, and I only asked you two Aristotle short answer questions. Right. Um, second one, in Book 2 of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle defines virtue of character and discusses how it's developed. So, define virtue of character and briefly discuss how it's developed. This is fairly easy. Um, I do it lickety split for you in the videos, so um, that is fairly straightforward. Um, and then again in the video I discuss this. Um, uh, the second part of this question, um, and I should mention that the previous assignment, I had some students answering maybe half the question, that gets you half marks because you answered half the question. Make sure to answer the full question. Um, uh, so second part of this question, in Book 2, Section 4 of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle identifies three requirements for genuine virtue. Um, this is the passage, but surely actions are not enough. On page 22, it's um, in, what a paragraph and a half down from there. Um, briefly discuss each. Um, I list them on the video on the chalkboard behind me, so um, you should have fairly easy access um, to these requirements. Um, I like them, and I think it's something clever Aristotle does in his Nicomachean Ethics. So. Um, that's a two-part question. Um, if virtue of character, what is it? How do you get it? Uh, three requirements for the second one. All right. Um, question three, we're on to Hobbes here. Hobbes introduces a rather bleak account of human nature and describes the natural condition of uh, mankind. Excuse the gendered language there in detail. Briefly introduce each. So human nature, what are we as human beings, right? uh, followed by a discussion, and then the natural condition of mankind, right? um, the state of nature. So that's your first task. Right? Uh, the human beings are, and our natural condition is, according to Hobbes. Right? Um, but it, but boo, uh, briefly introduce each, followed by a discussion of, uh, of how, according to Hobbes, the state of nature, a nat natural condition of mankind, arises as a consequent, uh, a consequences of his account of human nature. Remember, the natural condition of humankind is basically what would happen if we didn't have these artificial institutions to protect us from one another. What would happen if every human being was led by the desires that Hobbes describes every being, human being uh, being led by with no sort of artificial external constraint on those desires. It, just about every post-apocalyptic movie out there describes this, right? Um, so anyhow, uh, that should be fairly straightforward. Um, I do it in some detail in my videos um, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the School of Life video is actually a very quick sort of introduction to this. It's, it's the basic move of the early part of Hobbes' argument there. Um, now, chapter 14, this is question number four, uh, Hobbes distinguishes between a right of nature and the laws of nature. Define each. And so, oh, what's your right of nature? Your basic inalienable right uh, to preserve your life by any means at your disposal. What are the laws of nature? Right? Uh, well, these are a little different, right? Quick and ready calculations of self-interest. Um, define each. I just did for you. Um, no, I don't need a, a list of the laws of nature, but it would perhaps suggest it be good to introduce the first law. See, peace, and fall. Anyhow, it's right at the beginning of chapter 14. Um, in the same section, Hobbes introduces the idea of a covenant. Why are covenants important to Hobbes' argument? 
All right. So you've got a right of nature, you've got the laws of nature, and you've got covenants. They're all cram jammed in to chapter 14 in Hobbes, which is short. Right. So uh, why is Hobbes drawing a connection between these elements of his philosophy? Covenants are convenient articles of peace. It might have something to do with the first law of nature. Uh, yeah, anyhow, that's question number four. Right? So um, that hopefully should be straightforward. Um, question number five, your final short answer question, the last one on Hobbes. Uh, discuss the covenant that gives rise to the commonwealth introduced by Hobbes in chapter 17 being sure to cite the actual covenant itself found on page 227. So, first thing you should do is turn to page 227. And here it is, italicized on page 227. I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man or to this assembly of men on this condition that thou give up their, thy right to him and authorize all of his actions in like manner. Oddly, think back to Socrates. This was the basis of social contract, according to Hobbes, right? This is the social contract, right? Um, so, anyhow, right? discuss the covenant that gives rise to the commonwealth introduced by Hobbes in chapter 17, being sure to say. So, cite it. Um, just type it out. That's no big deal, right? And then discuss uh, what it does. Right, um, and then briefly discuss how this covenant, which establishes sovereign power, and that's its point, uh, breaks down the distinction between public and private good in the person of the sovereign. So, interestingly for Hobbes, this is what he's up to. This becomes very clear in the final chapter that we took a look at, chapter 19, because <coughs> The problem is when power has to be shared, right? When I have some power and you have some power, really Hobbes puts, um, it's page 161 of Hobbes, a perpetual desire for power after power that ceases only in death as the, 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 the drive behind all human activity. Really what we want is power. So if I have some power and you have some power and we're competing for power, then what we are always and everywhere going to do is seek our own private interest before we seek the public good. Interestingly, with this covenant, which I just cited to you, I authorize and give up my right of governing myself, da 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 da, -da. what we've done is we've given all, all the power to this one person, the sovereign. And it's that act of giving all the power to that one person, the sovereign, that makes the sovereign sovereign. So how much power does the sovereign have? How much power we give the sovereign. So for the sovereign to seek privately for his own interest is to seek the public good, right? This is the whole reason Hobbes argues sort of strangely that, you know, the, 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 the commonwealth should be in the hands of one person because when it is, it's an assembly of people that have to share power and have a limited stake in things, they're always going to choose their own private interests, right? So, think the activities of special interest groups bribing or applying people, but the sovereign has all of the power and all of the wealth. It, 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 uncorruptible, right, is Hobbes' argument there. So, right, the, the sovereign lacks nothing, so no one of the sovereign subjects can appeal to the self-interest of the sovereign because the sovereign has all the power and all the wealth, right? So um, this is a funny sort of thing. And interestingly, the actions, this is, Hobbes is relying on the human nature, right, of 
whoever is in this position, because none of us are trustworthy to have this kind of power, except insofar as we're trustworthy enough to seek after our own private interests. So the sovereign seeking after their own private interest actually produces the public good because subjects that are well off are better for the sovereign than subjects that are poor because they help to generate the public wealth right? and increase the power of the sovereign. So interestingly, Hobbes has created an institution that just trusts humans to be humans here. And that's what's going on. Um, I've given you a lot for that one because it's an inference that in the past some students have had trouble making and I just don't want to give you a question that you can't answer. Right? Okay, so those are the short answer questions. Longer answer question. So, minimum of three paragraphs in response, and a paragraph is a minimum of three sentences, so minimally to pass. What you need to do is put nine sentences together. That's, but that's a minimum note, all right? Uh, the goal for this section is to make a short argumentative account of the material at hand, as directed by the question below. One question, 10 points. Question. The force of the argument offered by Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics relies upon a determinate concept of happiness, which he defines as an activity of the soul in accord with virtue and our ability to attain satisfaction within our lives. So, we need to know what happiness is. We need to know how to go at it, right? I have a busted office chair here, clearly. I almost fell over. That was funny, right? Um, so... Right? That's what Aristotle's ethics requires. Right? That's where its force comes from. It is on the basis of this account of happiness that Aristotle is able to make any of the normative read should claims. You should do this. You should not do that. And that's what a normative claim is that he makes. Happiness for Aristotle is the end at which all actions really aim. Now, Hobbes, on the other hand, argues that happiness, felicity, is sim simply, and I'm quoting Hobbes here, continual success in obtaining those things which a man from time to time desires, that is to say, continual prospering, is that, um, is that men call felicity. All right. So Hobbes, that's from page 129. Effectively, for Hobbes, happiness is getting what you want. Hobbes goes on to argue that since desire is infinite and power is finite, happiness cannot be perpetual. Accordingly, for Hobbes, all action does not aim at happiness or felicity, as Aristotle claims, but rather at power, our present means to attain some future apparent good. Hobbes, page 150. So, you've got Aristotle with a determinate concept of happiness and that happiness being achievable in action. That's, that those are the two basic sort of primal claims that Aristotle is making. Then you've got Hobbes saying that happiness, it's just getting what you want, and you can't always get what you want. So what you really want is power, right? Distinct definitions of happiness and distinct sort of primary motives for human beings. So happiness on the one hand, power on the other. Your task is to discuss the distinction between the arguments presented by Hobbes and Aristotle. You should also take a position in the debate. For example, Hobbes is correct. It's all about power. Or Aristotle is correct. A satisfied life comes from happiness. It's not all about power. All right. See, for Aristotle, it was about developing character and these virtues that help you get what you want, yes, but also have some sort of intrinsic value. For Hobbes, all value is extrinsic, right? It is in terms of just getting what you want whenever you want, right? So, major distinction between these theorists, I, wanna, I, I want to see you take a side in this debate. Right? Is it all about power or is it all about happiness? 
or really is there some sort of weird argument where for Hobbes power is about satisfaction what we really want is satisfaction so it turns out that Aristotle's correct again anyway there are lots of clever ways to go about this um, straightforward would be easiest um, one last note if you're not sure what any of these questions or what some of these questions are asking if you're not sure what you're supposed to do I'd be more than happy to have a Skype meeting with you send me an email we can set something up I'm here to help I want to help you succeed I succeed everything is good All right so um, it's I'm not trying to fool you with any of these questions I'm not trying to uh, throw you off with any of these kinds of questions this material is difficult material it is All right it's hard to wrap your mind around that's why you need a course in it um, so I'm here to help with anything that I can help with okay well uh, I look forward to reading your responses and um, have good days one for each of you